This NFL makes absolutely no sense. None. This league is absolute madness. Welcome, football fans, to your NFL Week 5 Sunday reaction and recap, where I give you my thoughts on each and every NFL game from Week 5 this Sunday. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers set the tone on Thursday night. What do I mean by that? I mean that Tampa Bay set the tone in terms of wacky, wild, crazy losses that make absolutely no sense and games that go down to the wire. And on the other side, the Atlanta Falcons set the tone for crazy comebacks, wild endings, Kirk Cousins putting up 500 yards on Thursday night football. That was the kind of week that it was in the NFL. And I have to say it right up front, man. Gronk spiked the like button. Don't forget to subscribe for more NFL reactions every Sunday just like this. Wow. I have to say. A blind monkey. No, let me correct. A blind and deaf monkey could be better at picking games right now than me. Like, this is crazy. Is anyone else with me, man? This is absolute madness. I do not recall an NFL season through five weeks having more inconsistencies, having more illogical results, having more games where teams that should have won lost and teams that won should have lost and like just crazy plays, like blocked kicks, blocked punts, pick sixes, wild momentums, comebacks. Like the NFL right now is absolutely king for entertainment. But if you're making a name, and I'm not saying that's the primary thing that I do, although you know, it hasn't hurt me over the years. I've enjoyed picking games, and I've been good at it. And it, it is just really frustrating for me right now. It is very hard to get through a day with energy, passion, and positivity right now. I mean, I'm tearing myself up. I'm ripping my hair out of my head. I'm beating myself up. I'm punching the wall. I'm throwing remotes. Like, I, I, it's insane. Like, these weeks in the NFL, like, I want to be right about these games. And it just feels like whatever I do, I am not right. So, we're going to talk about every game. You guys let me know what you thought about week five. What was your biggest takeaway from week five? What was your biggest lesson from week five? And then also let me know, like, one thing that you think people will overreact to that you think probably they shouldn't. So let's begin with the first game of the day, which was the London game, which that's how my day started, man. So I should have seen it coming, but I wanted to go live for this game on the channel. Unfortunately, of course, guys, you guys know I live in Canada and for whatever reason, this game is usually on NFL Network. All London games, all Europe games, Germany, whatever, have been on NFL Network since, like, I can remember. And this game was blocked for whatever reason. They were showing Joe Namath a football life over Vikings Jets in Canada. And I believe it's because there's a streaming service called The Zone that had exclusive rights to the game. So I did not know that, assuming the game would be on NFL Network or maybe even cable like NFL Sunday Ticket. Neither. So I was scrambling around to go live on YouTube. And by the time I could figure out like a stream to watch that I got from the Discord, shout out to the BLV Discord. You guys can join for free in the description where our community is at. We talk about football every Sunday, all week long. It's NFL, NFL all the time in there with a bunch of wacky dudes. But like 
that was frustrating to begin the day. I wanted to go live. I wanted to talk about Aaron Rodgers versus his old rival, the Vikings. And, you know, I don't get to get the stream until the second quarter. And ultimately, I'm just watching the game. But it was actually a pretty good game. It actually ended up being a pretty interesting game. And I think this is where I would begin with the Vikings have to be at the top of your power rankings because they're 5-0. and But again, this was probably like their most lackluster, least impressive performance of the season. And we led into this week understanding that this matchup, this was actually like one of the more correct calls I made of the week. Like the Vikings probably winning the game, but it being pretty competitive. The Jets matching up fairly well with the Vikings, especially on the defensive side of the ball, potentially frustrating the Vikings offense. And Aaron Rodgers being able to make some nice, pretty throws down the field, getting the ball out quick. Garrett Wilson, you know, a lot of receptions underneath and things like that. And I think we were pretty accurate on guessing the game overall. The way the game began kind of began like every other Vikings game. Crazy plays that result in in big game-changing momentum for Minnesota. They have an interception return for a touchdown. They also have a ham fullback dive touchdown and a field goal. So they're up 17 to nothing before the half. And then Alan Lazard is able to get in the end zone before halftime. So it's 17 to 7. The second half, I thought, was pretty much dominated by the Jets. They had multiple chances to win this game. And I would even say in the first half, the Jets probably cost themselves by not kicking a field goal early in the game and going for it on fourth down. Robert Sala makes a critical early game mistake where the game's only 10 to nothing. And in my opinion, when a game is only 10 to nothing and you believe you have a good, strong defense and you can make it a one score game, you should always try to make it a one score game in the first half. Take the points when they're there. If it's not fourth and one and you're very, very good at picking up fourth and one or you're facing a really bad run defense, just kick the field goal on fourth and two and live with it. And move on because you never know you might need that field goal at the end of the game. So that was a critical mistake by Robert Sala. But there were a lot of mistakes by the Jets in this game. Rodgers threw three interceptions, one of which was one of the worst passes I've seen all season. He just soared the ball right over his receiver's head right into the lap. I believe it was Metellus on the interception. Like one of the worst passes I've ever seen. One of them was just a classic Andrew Van Ginkle drop back in coverage. Brian Flores showing blitz. Who's dropping? Who's coming? Van Ginkle drops right under perfectly designed right under like the, the crossing routes underneath of the strong side of the Jets empty formation. Van Ginkle picks it off, runs for a touchdown. That was one of the interceptions. And then the last interception was the game-winning, game-clinching interception by who else but Stephon Gilmore. When you need a game-clinching interception, whether it's the Super Bowl, whether he's playing for the Colts, the Cowboys, or now, you know, the Vikings, Stephon Gilmore is your guy. I mean, how many of these games have we seen ended in a big spot on primetime in a big moment with Stephon Gilmore intercepting a pass? Like, how many of them, right? So... Three interceptions for Aaron Rodgers, but that's not really the mistakes I'm referring to. I'm more so referring to, like, the offline passes, the drops by, like, Alan Lazard, the just, like, it felt like the Jets are disjointed on offense. There's something wrong if you catch my drift. Like, a lot of Aaron Rodgers... There's a guy open or he'll like miss him or a lot of drops, a lot of drops and a lot of penalties by the Jets in the first half, which allowed the Vikings to kind of move down the field pretty effectively. A lot of holdings. I specifically remember a couple on Sauce Gardner. The Vikings did end up with 11 total penalties for 80 yards. So penalties are no excuses. Eight penalties for 76 yards on the Jets, though. Just generally a lot of penalties. This was one of those games where the Vikings actually did not play that well on third down, and they were still able to come through, which I think is impressive. I think they struggled on third down because the Jets do have good cover corners. Their pass rush, I felt, put more heat on Sam Darnold than other teams. And I think the biggest thing for the Jets, which I think other teams might be able to take away is that they did a good job against the Vikings' run game. Aaron Jones left the game, but even to that point, he only had seven carries for 29 yards, which is only 4.1 yards per carry. 
And if you slow down the Vikings run game, if you make Sam Darnold a traditional drop back passer, you will see the splits in his EPA where he's really bad in drop back pass this year, but really amazing in play action pass. So if you make Sam Darnold a more traditional drop back quarterback, he will struggle, which is why the Vikings were four for 13 on third down, 0 for one on fourth down. Neither team ran the ball particularly well. Brees Hall struggled once again, nine carries for 23 yards, 2.6 yards per carry. His fantasy owners are hating him right now. Garrett Wilson had an outrageous 22 targets in this game. He had 101 yards on 13 catches, which is only a 7.8 yards per catch. He actually did play well and made some plays and he scored a touchdown, but I mean, just a lack of explosiveness from the Packers in this game. A lot of short passes. Every time, you know, Rodgers was able to get Garrett Wilson the ball in the flat or like on a quick out or a quick slant, he was throwing it to Garrett Wilson every single time. Jefferson had a good but not great game, kind of an inefficient game for him. Six catches on 14 targets, which is eight incompletions. I would say that's just a good job by the Jets secondary read Sauce overall, 92 yards for Jefferson. And then the the yards were relatively even. Like when I watched the game and by the end of the game, I felt like the Jets could have won this game, if not should have won this game, if I'm being honest. Like by the end of the game, you look at the three turnovers, you look at the fourth down failure. Uh, yeah, the Vikings did have that one fumble miscue on the toss to Chandler, and that was a big momentum play in the game. The Vikings were in control at that point, but it felt like the Jets were overwhelmingly the better team in the second half, while the Vikings were able to catch the fire early and gain the lead early. So this was another one where Vikings fans are going to hate my analysis on the game, but that's truthfully what I saw. I think definitely Vikings fans would agree that this is probably the least effective the Sam Darnold Vikings offense looked. Darnold 14 for 31, 179, and an interception. Rodgers had moments of playing well, but he also had moments of you know, maybe being a little bit too conservative, getting the ball out too fast to the flat instead of holding the ball, making a throw down the field, taking a hit. I think there were times where Rodgers, you know, sailed the ball. He was a little bit off in his accuracy compared to most moments. And obviously critical turnovers at bad moments and bad times. So, yeah, I I think the game is basically even outside of the pick six. So, I think for the Jets, this is more so an encouraging result, despite the loss. I actually felt like I saw some good things from the Jets, especially on defense. I thought they dominated when they needed to in the second half. And like I said, they only allowed 16 offensive points from a Vikings team recently that has been very, very dominant. And this was a Vikings team with Jordan Addison. And, you know, a neutral field game that's not typically easy to play defense in. Also... I thought the Vikings defense lived up to expectations. They create a lot of negative plays. They did great against the run. They didn't allow the Jets to run the ball, which forced Rodgers into a lot of passing attempts. And 54 attempts for the Jets right now is just not going to work because they're just too simplistic through the passing game. They're too. The Vikings are able to outcoach them in that regard. And I think that's the biggest storyline of this game. This was a much better coaching staff against a much worse coaching staff. And the Jets' talent tried their darndest to win. But ultimately, I think the coaching mismatch, especially early in the game before the Jets could get a hold of it, was just too much to overcome. So 23-17, to Minnesota ends up taking it. Those are my overall thoughts. Garrett Wilson and Aaron Rodgers finally get on track. Brees Hall still struggling. Sam Darnold, his worst game. Vikings defense shows up once again in a big spot. But this was a defensive game between two good defenses. The Jets, there's some positives to take away here for sure. Six-point loss against a 5-0 undefeated Vikings team. But Vikings continue to prove why they should be at the top of your power rankings. Because despite not a very good game, they still end up beating a pretty talented opponent, even if the Jets do have their flaws. The next game I want to discuss is, of course, my New England Patriots falling to the Miami Dolphins. Patriots are now 1 and 4, Dolphins 2 and 3. Dolphins win 15 to 10. Despite New England leading for a majority of the game until like midway through the third quarter, the Patriots were leading the game. 
I believe maybe even till the fourth quarter, the Patriots were leading the game. So, yeah, it was one of those games. It was a, a defensive battle for sure. It was a lot of the offenses are just not very good. But how do I describe this? I, I feel like the Dolphins were the better team. And the Patriots did have a chance to win this game at the end. Of course, it's one of those bizarre rules that nobody really ever thinks of, of the receiver catching the ball in the back of the end zone, but his feet are facing the wrong direction. If your feet, if your feet are facing the stands, it's actually easier to keep your feet in than it is your heels. It's one of, it's one of those rules where you can toe tap, but you can't heel tap as well. So... Jalen Polk would have put the Patriots up very late in the game, and they probably go on to win the game if that touchdown stands. And honestly, I thought it was 100% a touchdown. You guys let me know uh, what you thought of that ending. Obviously, the refs do get the right call in the end, but it was a tough pill to swallow as a Pats fan. I will say overall, though, you know, like Miami probably, it's better for the NFL if they won this game just because like, if Tua does end up coming back, at least the Dolphins have a chance to make a run and at least a chance to be competitive in the division. The Patriots just once again prove they're the worst team in football in this game. Like, their defense wasn't bad, but they still allowed 24 first downs to the Miami Dolphins with Snoop Huntley. 372 total yards, 193 rushing yards. Like, the Patriots' defense did make opportunistic plays, did have some stops, did force, you know... Some plays like a blocked a blocked field goal on special teams. Sanders missed a field goal. The Christian Gonzalez interception early, which allowed New England to capitalize and go up 10-0. So New England had some good plays here, and like they could have won the game. I thought New England's rushing attack looked as good as it's looked since week two with 151 yards. Ramondre Stevenson had a long 33-yard touchdown. Gibson had a good game as well. Stevenson, 12 for 89, 7.4 yards per carry, and a touchdown. It did feel like their run game was rather lackluster in the second half, or they seemed to get away with it or get, get away from it, not away with it. They should have stuck with it more. Demario Douglas didn't have a bad game, six catches for 59. Tyreek had a sighting, six catches for 69 yards. Although Christian Gonzalez, I thought, played him phenomenally well. And a lot of the time, he was actually covered one-on-one -on -one by Gonzalez, which pretty much no team in football does. Even in man coverage, Gonzalez was tracking Tyreek Hill in crossing route scenarios and things like that. But I felt like Miami was much better coordinated in this game. From an offensive standpoint, they used a lot less motion, which I think allowed it to be simple for Huntley. And he operated the system pretty, pretty well, I thought, overall, in terms of like what the expectations are. His stats won't jump off the page, but I thought he did play a better game than he did against the Titans. 18 for 31, 194, an interception, and a 63 passer rating. Like I said, not a very good overall statistical day, but you mix that in with a very efficient running game, a few big passes on some third downs. Uh, and, you know, just not making a lot of critical mistakes, and Huntley got the job done in the end with a clutch drive to have Ingold pl plunge in for the touchdown. Um, what else is there to say about this game? The Patriots punted six times. The Dolphins only punted three times. The Patriots had 12 penalties for 105 yards, and I want to say a lot of them came on offense, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, what else? Miami also lost a fumble in the game. They actually fumbled three times. They lost one of them. So, and third down was atrocious for both teams. And then just at the end of the day, I think Miami, it's better that they win because they've got more long-term prospects this season, potentially getting Tua back. Miami's defense needs to figure out how to stop the run, but they didn't have too many issues with Jacoby Brissett until the end of the game where Brissett was able to drive the field and hit Polk in the end zone. They called it incomplete, like I said. Now, in terms of the Patriots, I'm not too shocked they lost this game. I expected it to go either way within like six points, and they end up losing. I just think their offense didn't allow them really the, the room to breathe. Their defense was on the field far too much. Miami had 34 minutes of possession to New England's 25. And it just felt like, especially in that third and fourth quarter, Miami kept getting opportunities to win this game and take the lead. And it's really hard when all a team really needs is field goals to beat you. Like, 
somebody in my chat kept saying, if I lose to tw- uh, th- four field goals against, I'm going to be like irate. And he's exactly right. Like, that's exactly what Miami basically did. They did score a touchdown, but they had three field goals and they could have had five. So, yeah, Miami just kept getting into range to kick a field goal and kicked a field goal. Sometimes they got blocked, sometimes they missed, but most of the time they made it. And against the Patriots, that's all you really need, right? You know, Miami was two for 11 on third down and 0 for 1 on fourth down, and they still won this game and had 24 first downs. They were pretty effective in the second half running the ball specifically. Um, Brissett still very conservative, checking it down. Feels like he's his clock in his head at times is too slow and at times it's too fast. I thought he made a couple of nice throws in this game, but also a couple of erratic, you know, not decisions, but erratic kind of placement throws too high, too low, right or left. And again, the run game was better, but this team needs Drake May, man. The O-line still sucks, but I thought there was moments in the game where they actually performed okay. I I don't know what to think, man. It's just the Patriots lose. I kind of expected them to lose. It could have went either way. I ended up picking them this week just because I thought it was a winnable game. But, you know, Jabril Peppers out, Kyle Duggar out, Dave Andrews out, Christian Barmore out, Jawan Bentley out. I mean, you're talking about five of the 10 best players on the Patriots team. At this point, this team is is really, really lacking talent, explosive players on either side of the ball. It just, it is what it is. The, the, the team is not good. I'd be genuinely surprised if they won two more games at this point for this season. This was potentially one of the games they could have won. So New England drops it 15 to 10, despite a chance to win in the end. But, you know, of course it doesn't work out for them. Carolina Panthers and the Chicago Bears. This is probably the game I see I saw the least of. So I'll have to go back and watch this one. But this was pretty much pure domination from the Chicago Bears. 24 to 14 in terms of first downs for the Bears. And they had 424 yards, 296 of those yards coming from Caleb Williams and the passing game. This one also saw some of the least amount of penalties, only nine penalties in the entire game. The Panthers fumbled four times. They lost two fumbles in this game, and Dalton also threw an interception. This was by far Andy Dalton's worst game of the season so far, 18 for 28, 136, and an interception. Hubbard did have a successful day on the ground with 7.5 yards per carry, but it was too far gone. The, The Bears were just eating this terrible Panthers defense for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The score at halftime, I think, was 28-7. to And Caleb threw two touchdowns to DJ Moore in the first half, one from 34 yards out, another from 30 yards out. Roshan and DeAndre Swift ended up getting into the end zone, and they basically kind of just soared from there. I mean, the Bears defense, we know now, Excellent defense. And this was kind of like my theory for this game. I picked the Bears because their defense superior. They were favored in this game, but only by four points. And some sharp people were saying, take the Panthers because of how they've looked with Andy Dalton. But my theory was basically this this defense in Carolina is so bad and so exposable that if the Bears play proper on offense, they should be able to take advantage. And that's exactly what happened. And the Bears defense was not going to allow Andy Dalton to, you know, throw all over them and make a bunch of plays. Caleb, by far his best performance in the NFL, 20 for 29, 304, and two touchdowns through the air. The run game of the Bears was a little bit better in terms of balance, 128 total yards. DeAndre Swift, still not efficient though, only 3.5 yards per carry. DJ Moore had a huge revenge game, five catches for 105 yards and two touchdowns. That's a 21 yards per catch average like I said Bears took advantage of the terrible Panthers defense early Bears defense closed it out in the second half and that was their by far most complete game best game by Caleb Williams and this Bears team is now trending in the right direction they did play a weak opponent here in Carolina but based on the NFL results right now you can't take anyone for really an easy win in this league so Bears are now three and two surprisingly 
Before this game, I would have told you that they looked extremely overrated and not as good as their record. But now with a 36 to 10 win over the Panthers where Caleb actually plays well and they have a collective effort and an all around team win offense and defense, not just defense and special teams plays, but actual offense and defense. That makes me think about this team back to where I thought they would be in the preseason, which was like flirting with the playoff conversation. If Caleb can continue to build on this and gain that confidence, we should be looking at a team that will be right there in the in the wild card mix. Panthers are still absolutely brutal. They are one of the three worst teams in football with Miami and New England right now, and that's pretty definitive. I think... As teams continue to see the tape on Andy Dalton and this offense, they'll continue to understand how to digest it and how to attack it. And I think the Bears kind of laid the blueprint. And the thing about the Panthers is, if you're going to have an Andy Dalton at quarterback at this point in his career with kind of mediocre weapons around him and a good but not great offensive line, you're going to have to have an awesome defense. And the problem is that the Panthers have a bottom three defense in the NFL. So... 36 to 10 Carolina. The Colts and the Jags, a wild 37 to 34 ending. Trevor Lawrence ends up having his best game of the season, but Joe Flacco might have been the story of the game. 33 for 44, 359 yards and three touchdowns. And it makes you wonder why Joe Flacco was not signed to be a starting quarterback in the NFL. Should the Raiders have signed Joe Flacco over Gardner Minshew? You do wonder that. Should the Colts have started Joe Flacco in week one? I'm not sure what it looked like in training camp, but I'm sure Joe Flacco probably looked better than Anthony Richardson based on how the two have played in this offense. It is light years of a difference. I don't think the Colts even come close in this game if Anthony Richardson is the quarterback. 33 for 44. First of all, the Colts wouldn't have even decided to throw the ball 30, 44 times. And Richardson probably would have completed it 17 times instead of 33. Flacco nearly, you know, putting up a 360-yard day, three touchdowns, no interceptions, 24 points in the fourth quarter. Uh, it was a bit of a controlled game by Jacksonville. It was at one point 20 to 10, and it felt like Jacksonville was going to kind of glide to a victory, but the Colts put up 24 fourth quarter points. Jacksonville put up 17, and it was a wild back and forth shootout of a fourth quarter that was just an aerial assault. Colts had 25 first down on Jacksonville's defense. Jacksonville had 20. Jacksonville actually was only 3 for 10 on third down. Indy was 7 for 14 with Joe Flacco on fourth down. Jacksonville did have more yards, nearly 500, 497. They also had four sacks on the day, and the Colts had zero. And the craziest thing of all, the Colts had zero, zero uh, interceptions, zero sacks, Jacksonville only punted twice, and there was only eight penalties in the entire game. So th this was kind of a wild ending with a bit of a boring, predictable beginning where people thought Jacksonville would win this game, right? No Jonathan Taylor, bunch of players on defense for the Colts missing, a bunch of backups in there with Moore being out and Pay being banged up and all these guys being banged up, but... Hey, uh, give credit to Joe Flacco for hanging in there and making this one interesting. I think the Colts are con going to continue to be interesting. Alec Pierce had three catches for 134 yards and a touchdown. He had two long like catches in the fourth quarter that set up one touchdown, and he scored the other touchdown. Brian Thomas, another very promising game. The rookie, five catches, 122 yards, and a touchdown. Tank Bigsby continues to be very impressive on the ground. 13 carries, 101 yards, 7.8 yards per carry, and two tutties on the day. But like I said, Lawrence, much better against a very weak and depleted defense of the Colts. They could run the ball. They could throw the ball. And ultimately, the Colts just couldn't keep stride. They just ultimately couldn't get enough plays to come back and win this game. But give credit to Joe Flacco and the Colts, an undermanned Colts defense that got shredded. So... 37-34 Jags. Jags, I, I would say this is this is good for them. This is promising for them. They are one and four now. Colts, I believe, are two and three, if I'm not mistaken. So, and and the weird thing is, when I was watching Jacksonville in the first half, they kind of looked like the team I thought they would be before the year. But it just appears to be too late, too little, too late for this team in terms of, I think, turning this season around. It's a nice win to have. 
I just think it's going to be a lot to overcome. They're not the most talented team in the world, and they just beat a very undermanned Colts team. The next game is the Texans and the Bills. 23-20 final. Texans win on a game-winning field goal at the very end. This was kind of a tale of two halves. The Texans, I wouldn't say, uh, maybe you could say dominated, but they did control the entire first half. Akers scores after a Bass field goal. Nico Collins scores, which is 14-3. Then it's 17-3 going into halftime, and Texans have control of the game. In the second half, though, three touchdown or two touchdowns, sorry, from Cook and Coleman by Buffalo, and only two field goals from the Texans. And the Texans just couldn't put this game away. And I think the big reason for that is they couldn't run the ball at all. They couldn't run the ball in the second half. They couldn't get anything going. The Bills' defensive line started to dominate the game. I thought that without Nico Collins out there, he ended up leaving the game after his touchdown. Once Nico Collins left, and you can kind of see this in the box score, Cam Akers touchdown, Nico Collins touchdown, then three field goals from the Texans for the rest of the game. And those two touchdowns were in the first quarter from the Texans. For the rest of the game, only three field goals. Once Nico Collins left... You could sense that the Bills were playing tighter, more aggressive, better coverage, and it made C.J. Stroud's life difficult. I do think Stroud had another MVP type of performance where he was constantly evading and avoiding pressure. He was 28 for 38, 331 yards. Once again, another 300-yard day, a touchdown, and an interception. Now, I will say his interception was bad. A bad moment, a bad throw, a bad decision. He doesn't see Bernard dropping into coverage in a zone late in the game. This ultimately allowed the Bills to get a field goal to tie the game at 20. You know, the Texans were in control. I think they were up at that point 20 to 17. And then he throws an interception, which allows Buffalo to go up. I think that's what happened. It might have been a little bit later. I can't quite recall. But I'm pretty sure that's what happened. And Stroud just makes a terrible judgment call and throws an interception. Now, I think the big headliner in terms of box score is Josh Allen's passing statistics. Nine for 30. Nine for 30. I mean, how often do you see an elite player and an elite quarterback like Josh Allen with a 9 for 30 stat line, 131 yards and a touchdown? I thought the Texans secondary and the Texans overall defensively played lights out phenomenal football. Did they allow some big runs to James Cook, Johnson, Allen, and company? Yes, the occasional big run did exist there, but man... The Bills could not throw the ball really at all in this game with any sort of consistency. All of their passing plays were rather quick underneath or like an occasional explosive that would come from Josh Allen running around. Everything else was Allen got pressured a little bit more than usual and the secondary was so sticky. The Bills receivers dropped passes left and right. Mac Hollins couldn't catch a cold. Um... Coleman dropped a couple big passes in the game. He was only one on five targets. His one catch was an explosive down the left sideline touchdown. But otherwise, he was dreadful in the game. The Bills really missed Khalil Shakir in this game. If if Khalil Shakir plays, I think the Bills probably win. But you have to say that the Texans also didn't have Nico Collins. There were injuries on both sides, right? But... Joe Mixon, for example, Ed Oliver, for example. But you look at the box score, the Texans were more efficient on third down. And ultimately, they had way more yards, 425 yards to 276. But I do think the story of the game in terms of why the Texans won was third down. Because the Bills were not able to throw the ball. And that was evident on third down. They were 3 for 14 on third down. That is very rare with Josh Allen and the Bills. They led the NFL in third down percentage in 2023. And only 1 for 1 on fourth down. Meanwhile, you know Houston 8 for 16 on third down. Um, Both teams only had one sack, and the Texans did punt only five times. The Bills punted eight times in this game. I think the best thing to say about Buffalo is because they didn't turn it over. They had zero fumbles and zero interceptions. Because they didn't turn it over, they were able to hang in the game, and their defense in the second half 
stood up to the challenge and they were stuffing the run continuously. Texans were trying to get the run game going. They weren't able to get it going. And then it would get to third down and long, which has been a problem for the Texans all year. That that kind of over-reliance on third and long. And in the first half, the Texans were able to throw the ball a little bit better underneath. They were able to run the ball a little bit better than expected. That was setting Stroud up for better third downs, for first and two downs. And ultimately, in the second half, it felt like every time they got to third down, the Bills were getting off the field, getting the Bills the ball back. Uh, and, you know, they get that big turnover from Stroud throwing the interception. So there are things like that that ended up happening. And Buffalo was able to fight their way back in. But they definitely got outplayed. They definitely deserve to lose. So this is one where, you know, I thought the Bills might win early in the week, kind of later in the week, looking at the the injuries and things. I'm not too surprised to see the Texans win this game. Didn't really know about Ed Oliver until about Friday. So that that obviously sucks. You know, um, Khalil Shakir didn't know about his absence. But I think what we saw in this game, the biggest flaw for the Bills receiving core They need a receiver. I mean, they really need to go out and get Devontae Adams if they want to do something this year. And honestly, that would fix so many of their issues because their defense does have their lapses and they do have their tough times against the run at times. But they're a good pass defense. They should figure out their pass rush. There's only so many matchups that actually give them issues on that side of the ball. And then on the other side, I mean, if Adam, if, if Adams comes in there or if Josh actually has a real receiver he can rely on instead of having Mac Collins out there constantly getting targets on third down, that's going to change this team drastically because they can run the ball and Allen is a beast and the O-line is good. And, you know, and you take Shakir away, who's that one receiver that actually separates, gets open and makes plays in big spots. And they just don't have a lot. I I actually do recall Kincaid maybe having a couple catches. But again, like the Bills are not getting a lot of production out of this receiving core. Then we have maybe the wildest game of the entire day. I will say the Bills definitely could have won that game in the end. They actually had the ball late with a chance to go down the field and get a field goal. But they were were, uh, halted by the Texan defense. So the Texans were able to take advantage of that with field position and get the game-winning field goal right at the end of regulation. The Ravens and Bengals, 41-38. This is a game that I would say the Bengals should have won this game. They were leading the entire time. I was feeling very good about taking the points with the Bengals as the underdog at home the entire time. But the Ravens were able to make a crazy comeback because I think the Bengals' mistakes The Bengals, you know, they throw an interception. Joe Burrow has an interception late in the game. And that's not really the way I want to lead this off with the Bengals because Burrow was ultimately 30 for 39 for 392 yards and five touchdowns, 137 passer rating. Burrow was certainly not the issue. He played very, very, very well. But his miscommunication and his off-target throw to Jamar Chase ended up costing them. Marlon Humphrey getting the interception. That was a huge play in the game, which allowed... The Ravens to kind of, I think it was tie it up at that point and then send it to overtime um, where the Ravens got the ball first. Lamar looks like he chokes the game away. They snap the ball through his fingers, you know, and Lamar has to chase the ball. The Bengals actually get it in overtime. Then they decide to run the ball three straight times as if they didn't watch Tampa Bay play on Thursday and... McPherson misses the kick. It's a bad snap, a poor hold, and then McPherson misses, I believe, wide right, which ultimately cost the Bengals the game because the then, you know, the Ravens only really need 20 yards to get into Justin Tucker field goal range. Derrick Henry rips off one run, I think, on the first play of that next series, and they get into field goal range. They win the game with Justin Tucker from 24 yards out. But again, Bengals issues, Bengals critical errors, Bengals, you know, beating themselves to a certain degree, but I felt like they were the better team for like 99% of the game. Um, they were leading, I think at one point 30, 30, was it 31 to 20 or something like that? Something like that. I mean, it was 17, 14 at half for the Bengals. It was 24, 21. And then I think it was 31-21 Bengals. And then the Ravens surged back at the end. Lamar did make some plays through the air. Zay Flowers, he had a huge game in this one. Flowers, 
had over 100 yards. I think he was targeted over 10 times. Isaiah likely did have two touchdowns in the game. Mark Andrews had more sightings in this game. I thought Chase Brown had a good game. He scored a touchdown through the air. He also led the Bengals with 12 carries. Jamar Chase had an amazing game, 10 catches for 193, 193 yards and two touchdowns. T. Higgins, I think, had two touchdowns as well through the air. Uh, so Chase and Higgins had two touchdowns, and they still lost. I mean, this just speaks to the Bengals' defense, giving up too many plays you know, down the field, one-on-one -on -one coverage. They're just not able to stick with these receivers. Zay Flowers was beating them every single time, man-to-man -man coverage or one-on-one. -on -one. The Ravens really didn't run the ball all that well until the end of the game. Like, Derrick Henry really didn't do anything until overtime. He had 15 carries for 92 yards. And when you consider Henry, I think, had like a 40 or 50-yard carry on that one carry. I mean, he had like 14 carries for like 40 or 50 yards. So that's a really big W for the Bengals considering how poor they were against the run. But because they were, they were kind of trying to stuff the run and forcing Lamar to throw, which is a good game plan, they weren't able to hang with Lamar in the passing game with these one-on-one -on -one matchups to Isaiah Likely, Mark Andrews, the play-action pass, and of course Zay Flowers who had a massive day. So, I mean, the Bengals' defense is just all around bad because when they're stopping the run, they can't stop the pass. When they can't stop the pass, they can't stop the run. They can't deal with balance. They couldn't deal with Lamar's legs extending plays. But I feel bad for Joe Burrow in this one because he was really awesome. Jamar Chase, really awesome. The offense of the Bengals is really freaking good. It's one of the best in football. It might be the best pure passing game in the NFL right now. And they end up losing, and they're 1-4, and four, and that's insane. So the Bengals... They might not make the playoffs now. Starting 1-4, and four, it's going to be a very tough road ahead. Now, they do play, moving forward, the Giants, the Browns, and the Eagles, then the Raiders, the Ravens, and the Rams, I believe, or maybe the Chargers. The Chargers. So, you look at their schedule right now, I think they can beat... The Giants, although the Giants just upset the Seahawks, they should beat the Browns once this year. I mean, they've been dominated by that team, but the Browns look absolutely atrocious. The Eagles, we'll see how healthy they are for that game. That's also in Cincinnati, and I actually like how the Bengals match up from an offensive standpoint against the Eagles' defense. So I wouldn't be shocked if they beat the Eagles. They play the Raiders. They should win that game. They play the Ravens. Maybe they'll get revenge. We'll see, and they play the Chargers. So when you look at their schedule, I mean... If they could get somehow to five and five in their next in their next four games, that would that would at least even themselves up to the degree where they would have to finish five and five after that for the rest of the year, right? Five and no. Sorry, my bad, terrible math. Um, they would have to finish five and two. And down the stretch. They play, so the next four is the Giants, I think. The Giants in New York on a primetime game. Then they've got Cleveland in Cleveland. Then they've got the Eagles. Then they've got the Raiders. So if they can find a way to go to, to, to win those four in a row or even to go four and one, then after that, you know, you get the, you get the Chargers, you get the Steelers, the Cowboys, the Titans, the Browns, the Broncos, and the Steelers. That's not a tough schedule. I mean, the, the Steelers are a divisional game, so it'll be one of those will be maybe a loss, right? But Dallas doesn't look very good, and it's in Dallas in a dome. Uh, Tennessee doesn't look good. They might have like Mason Rudolph at quarterback. The Browns look terrible, and the Broncos are feisty, but like they're not amazing. So. I still wouldn't rule the Bengals out at this point just because of their schedule alone and how good their offense is. If their defense can just be mediocre, this is a really good football team. I mean, they just played the Ravens. The Ravens looked incredible against the Bills. The Ravens offense was incredible in this game and obviously against the Bengals defense. Most teams look incredible. But the Ravens defense looked really good last week against the Bills and it looked terrible against the Bengals because that's how good the Bengals defense is or offenses, I should say. So, yeah, I'm not giving up on the Bengals. I mean, I mean, their record is, is bad, really bad, really tough spot. It's not going to be easy, no doubt about it. 
But this game, if if you flip it, I mean, if the Bengals win, which they should have, if the, if they would have won, both the, these teams are two and three, and I'd still be high on both of the teams because they both looked good in this game. This was not one of those games where I felt like two bad teams were fighting against each other. I more so got the vibes of of the Bills and Texans being like two flawed teams playing each other to a certain degree, more so than Ravens Bengals, where it looked like two legitimate good teams were playing and it was just a shootout. So that's kind of the sense I got from it. Um, Lamar played really well. Burrow played really well. Uh, Henry and didn't really do much. Chase was amazing. Flowers was amazing. Higgins was great. The The Bengals defense, I actually thought, made more plays in this game than they had previously. Like, they had a safety. They were making plays in the run game. They were causing negatives. But it felt like every time there was a third down, the Ravens would convert. They converted 10 out of 15 third downs, and then they were one for one on fourth down. That's 11 for 16 on third or fourth down, guys. So that was the story of the game for me is the Bengals weren't doing bad on early downs, but when it came to critical stop time, critical third down time, they couldn't get off the field. Lamar was extending and making a play, but he was finding a guy open, or they were just getting that short yardage with Derrick Henry uh, right up the middle. So yeah, man, crazy game, really good game. I watched pretty much the entire thing through the corner of my eye. I had three or four different games on, so I was paying attention to that game. And it just felt like Burrow was really on it, really crisp, really accurate, on time. Ravens defense had absolutely no answers for Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, and this Bengals offense. So I still have faith. I also look at the Ravens as a team that there's not going to be many teams, I feel, on on offense like the Bengals that are going to be able to decipher their coverages and slice and dice them and be able to just outman them at wide receiver compared to their defensive backs like that. So I think the Ravens' concerns defensively in this game, while they've been pretty constant in the secondary all year, it felt like not every team in the AFC is going to be able to attack them that same way. There might be only a couple other teams. So yeah, the Ravens' offense looks really, really good though. That was their best passing day of the season. Commanders destroy the Browns 34-13. to This game kind of looked close in the first quarter. <laughs> Like, it looked like, oh, like the the start of this game specifically. Like, the Browns, I think, caused a three and out for the Commanders or something. And then, you know, the Browns were were kind of moving the ball a little bit. And it kind of felt like, oh, this is kind of the way that I think the game's going to go. It's going to be close. We'll see who wins it in the end. Nope, that's not what happened. What we ended up seeing is just Deshaun Watson being arguably the worst quarterback in football once again. 15 for uh, 28, 125 yards and a touchdown, a 77.2 passer rating. He was absolutely dreadful. The The Browns were one for 13 on third down. One for 13. They had seven sacks in the game allowed to one of the worst pass rushes in the NFL, the Washington Commanders. They punted seven times. They had nine penalties. And then on the other side of things, Daniels was not pretty in this game, but he was explosive. 14 for 25, 238, one touchdown, one interception. And he made a lot of plays with his legs, scrambling for big yards. And because of the way that the Browns play their defense, they play a lot of man coverage. They're going to be aggressive, right? Daniels was able to beat them down the field with some big plays. Um, Deami Brown had a 41-yard touchdown. Terry McLaurin had a deep ball early in the game, which set up Robinson for one of his two touchdowns. Daniels was scrambling and avoiding pressure at a very high rate. And it felt like, you know, this was one of those games where from that side of of view, like the commanders were not nearly as efficient on offense as they've been in previous games where they were freaking dominant. They only had 19 first downs compared to like 30 in previous games, but they still had 343 yards or 334 yards. But many of them came from Jaden Daniels' legs. Um, And their run game wasn't bad either. Eckler did have some explosive runs, 11.2 yards per carry, six carries, 67 yards. Eckler and Robinson and McNichols is a nice little uh, running back trio. Deami Brown was extremely impressive in my opinion. Luke McCaffrey was making plays. McLaurin was a little bit more quiet, but he did make a couple explosives. I would just say this was one of those where I, I was watching early and it was like, 
this this game kind of more than any other, despite the stats looking more kind of like pedestrian for Daniels, this was perhaps his most impressive game. Just from the standpoint of like, the Browns were getting pressure. The Browns were playing tight coverage. But Daniels was able to extend. Daniels was able to create out of nothing, which is something that we hadn't seen as much of. Maybe a little bit against the Bengals because he had to do that because of the shootout. But it felt like in some of the games this year, it was rather you know system kind of oriented. This game to me, when they made a big play, it was very much on Jaden Daniels. Or, you know, the Deami Brown touchdown, he was just wide open. Deami Brown can run, dude. And that's what I remember from college. But, yeah, uh, that's kind of what stood out to me was the Browns defense, they kind of hung in there early. But they just, I think the Browns are imploding. Like, they they hate their quarterback. Deshaun Watson doesn't even want to go for it on fourth down. He wants to sit on the bench and you know, just collect his money. Like, he is absolutely horrible. He misses throw after throw. Even the throws that he makes are, like, they kind of look awkward. Like, the ball comes out funky. Uh, It was terrible. One thing I forgot to mention about the Bills game that I quickly want to go back to real quick is Josh Allen probably shouldn't have returned to this game. I think he was concussed at one point in the game. He got slammed on the left side of his head, and all they did was give him smelling salts, and they sent him back out there. That was one that I would examine if I was the NFL, because that didn't appear right, and Allen didn't exactly play amazing after that play. So, uh, yeah, that could have been a Tua. I'm not going to lie. That could have been a Tua right there. Allen is a big guy. He's a tough guy. But I wouldn't be surprised if he played with a concussion at the end of that game because he got slammed down. And that's the second week in a row where Allen has been slammed down on his side like that. So, yeah, that one was a little scary for me. The Broncos and the Raiders in the later slate, 34-18 to Broncos. This game actually looked like it was 100% going to go my way. I picked the Raiders because they had beat the Broncos. And this was pretty much the only reason. They had beat the Broncos eight straight times. Now, the Broncos beat the Raiders for the first time in in the last nine outings and, you know, first time in eight straight games that they've lost. It looked like the Raiders were going to win in the first quarter. It was 10-0. And then I think, you know, the the Broncos get a field goal. It's 10-3. But the Raiders are driving. They're inside the 10-yard line, and Minshew scrambles and rolls to his left and throws the ball over two of his targets into the arms of Pat Sertan. He runs it all the way back for a touchdown, and just like that, the game completely flipped. It's 10-10, and the game pretty much was complete and utter Bronco domination from there on out. The Raiders do end up being better on third down. They end up being better in terms of first downs. They end up having more yards at the end of the game, which is very similar to how the Broncos game went against the Jets. But ultimately, at the end of the day, Raiders have three interceptions. Uh, They turn the ball over three times. They have 11 penalties compared to Denver's uh, nine for only 44 yards. And the Broncos got way more explosive plays in this game uh, from their running game. Javante Williams had a solid game, 13 for 61. Bo Nix looked dreadful in this game. His stats appear to be good at the end of the game, 19 for 27 for 206 and 2, 117.2 passer rating. Those stats are a little deceptive in my opinion. Uh, McLaughlin had a touchdown. I think Minshew pretty much cost them this game, to be honest. I think... If Minshew plays a cleaner game, the Raiders probably go on to win, or at least it comes down to a field goal or the last second or something like that. If this game ends up being 17-3 to with a rookie quarterback on the other side, I don't care where the game is at, the, the Raiders probably win the game. But that's not what happened. Their defense, which has been showing up all year long for the Broncos, comes up with a massive play. The best player on their team, Pat Sertan, 99-yard interception return for a touchdown. And yeah, that's that. That was basically it. McLaughlin put in a touchdown there. It was seventeen. I or they got a they got a field goal. I think right before the halftime, so it was thirteen to ten. Then it was twenty to ten. And once it was twenty to ten, you knew the Raiders weren't going to win and come back. And then in the fourth quarter, you know the Broncos' offense kind of got it clicking. The Raiders' defense 
gave in a little bit. Christian Wilkins actually left the game, which I think unlocked the Broncos a little bit offensively. And Bo Nix scored a rushing touchdown. Reynolds scored a receiving touchdown. Uh, that was actually a nice throw by Nix to Reynolds for a touchdown. Brock Bowers did have a good game. Eight receptions on 12 targets for 97 yards. The Raiders continue to have a tough time running the ball. I thought Madison, uh, maybe it was Abdullah, but one of them had a couple nice runs, but I didn't feel like there was anything consistent there. The, the Raiders looked awful in the second half. They looked pretty competent early, but they looked awful in the second half. So now the Broncos are 3-2, and two, sitting in second place in the AFC West. Defense continues to shine and make big plays and change momentum. Bo Nix didn't make any mistakes. Minshew did, and that's why the Broncos win 34-18. to The Arizona Cardinals and the San Francisco 49ers. I'm going to need some water before this. Gronk spiked the like button, guys, if you haven't already. Um, this is another tough loss for the 49ers to swallow here. This is another game in which they really shouldn't have lost, but they did. Like, let's just go over the stats. Uh, the Niners had more first downs, 22 to 19. They were better on third down, 6 for 11. Cardinals were 3 for 10. They had pretty much equal rushing yards, a, a majority of the rushing yards for Arizona coming from a Kyler Murray 50-yard touchdown run. They had more passing yards. They had more total yards. Um, they... The only thing I would say is the Cardinals had is turnovers. The The Niners had three turnovers in the game, two interceptions, and a lost fumble inside the 10-yard line by Jordan Mason. The Niners had more possession, 32 minutes to 27. This was another loss by the Niners that they shouldn't have lost. This was very much like the Rams game, almost a replica in a lot of different ways, a, a pretty fluky loss. I would look for the Niners. I hope so. I'm going to the Thursday night game against a... The Seahawks, who looked awful against the Giants, we'll get to that, but 24 to 23 for the Cardinals, and a lot of things kind of intertwine here. So for the Niners, I thought that offensively, Ayuk had a great game. Uh, that stood out to me. Mason wasn't bad. He had 14 carries for 89 yards, but I felt like a majority of the runs were not efficient for him in this game. There was a couple explosives more so than there were consistent runs for good gains, which is something the Cardinals did well in this game. Ayuk had eight catches for 147 yards. Jawan Jennings was a bit beat up in the game and only caught a couple passes. I thought Kittle had a pretty good game overall. I thought the O-line for the Niners actually had a pretty darn good game overall. And I thought the defense for the Niners in the first half looked awesome. And for the most part, uh, in the first three quarters or so, I thought they looked really good. In the, in the fourth quarter, they kind of let up some ground game to James Conner, who had 4.5 yards per carry, 86 yards on 19 carries. Again, not outrageous numbers, but he was kind of grinding in the fourth quarter, allowing the Cardinals to come back. Kyler got a couple scrambles. They got a, a couple big plays. There was specifically a third down and six where the Niners got home on Kyler, but he backpedaled about 10 yards and threw the ball off his back foot with Leonard Floyd in his face, connected with Marvin Harrison Jr. for a big first down. That was a critical play in the game. Michael Wilson did have a pretty solid game, five catches for five, 78 yards. But you know, even Purdy, like his stats look horrendous here, but I thought in the... I thought overall he didn't play bad. I think he a couple a couple areas. So I thought in the red zone he struggled a little bit. He missed a couple throws that could have been touchdowns instead of field goals early in the game, which might have put the game away really early for the Niners in this one because the Niners were in full control. It was 23 to 10 at one point in this game entering the third quarter and, you know, I think that the record for Shanahan was like 28 and 0 at home entering the fourth quarter, like up 10 plus or something like that. That's the graphic they showed on the broadcast, uh, which kind of was kind of defeats the narrative. But the Niners, um, they just made too many mistakes. Like there was an interception in their own end. Purdy got the ball tipped at the line where uh, Mac Wilson dove and caught it. That set up a field goal for the Cardinals. Jordan Mason, they have a long drive. It looks like they're going to clinch the game. I think it was 
At that point, it was the fourth quarter, and I want to say it was 23. It was, man, what was the score? I think they would have gone up by 10, like double digits. They would have gone up by double digits or two scores, one or the other. And Mason fumbles. One of the Cardinal defender just comes in and he clubs the ball. And that was huge. And that allowed the Cardinals to turn that momentum around and come back on the Niners. The Niners kicker, Moody, got injured, which actually Wisnowski kicked one of the field goals for San Francisco earlier in the game. It was held by Juice, Kyle Hughescheck, and that was kind of fun to watch. But later in the game, it cost them because there was a 4th and 23 And it would have been like a 45-ish yard field goal for Moody, which is pretty makeable for him. And it would have put them to 26 points. Instead of going for that fourth down, if they have their kicker, they probably win this game uh, 26-21, probably. Because the Cardinals, I'm not sure if they would have been able to score a touchdown. It looked like they they were getting field goals, but both teams were kind of struggling to score in the red zone to a certain degree. Um... The Niners did capitalize off a blocked field goal for a touchdown. Ryland was blocked, a former Patriot kicker, for a long touchdown by Lenore, which was beautiful by their special teams. But, you know, you even look at the stats for the Cardinals, and I didn't think the Niners' defense played bad. 19 for 30, 195 yards for Kyler, one touchdown, one interception. He did do damage on the ground. Like I said, Connor was more of a volume guy in this game, kind of grinding plays out. Later in the game, the Niners struggled to tackle at certain points, um, and and then just a couple big catches, and then just turnovers and mistakes, uh, not even penalties. Like there were like no penalties in this game. There were five penalties in this game. Uh, Brock Purdy, the last interception, it looked like they were going to go down and get into field goal range for a potential punter field goal for the win, but. Brock Purdy got the ball tipped on an all-out blitz from the Cardinals. The ball was tipped once again and intercepted once again on a tip, which was the second of the game. So just the the common theme for the Niners here is they they just got completely unlucky again. And, you know, it's hard to say, like, this team keeps getting unlucky. Like, they have three losses. I would say two of them have been pretty unfortunate. One of them, they were outplayed, but they were still kind of in the game against Minnesota. The Rams game and this game felt very much like they should have won. So it's really hard to say. They're two and three. They easily could be four and one. Um, they're still that when you watch them, especially in this first half, they look like a really good team. It's just that some things go wrong for them. They they lose guys during the middle of the game. They have their kicker get injured. They get they, these t- wacky turnovers that aren't even like bad throws. It's like tipped at the line and intercepted. Like and then the fumble by Mason where maybe McCaffrey doesn't fumble that you you never know right but like that's tough man like it's a divisional game kind of wacky but the Cardinals give them credit they took full advantage just as the Rams did and it was a very similar script a very similar score the Niners are gonna have to rebound the Niners are gonna have to rebound I did actually think the Niners run defense in the first half was pretty exceptional James Conner didn't do anything I thought that their blitz looks and their third down packages looked more creative on defense this was one of the big narratives I was watching in this game I thought the Niners defense looked pretty good I thought the offense Ayuk looked good I thought Debo was very quiet in this game uh and you know Kittle was good but a Jennings was kind of quiet Purdy was a little up and down in terms of his accuracy in certain areas of the field. He did make some nice scrambles as well, but I think red zone killed them and turnovers killed them. I think ultimately that's probably what I could narrow it down to red zone offense and turnovers and a lack of a kicker. If they have a kicker, they probably still win, but that's just how it goes sometimes in the NFL. The Cardinals get an upset win and both teams are now two and three. Luckily for them, the Rams fell to one and four. The Seahawks are three and two because the Seahawks lost to the Giants. So they're only one game back and San Francisco actually plays Seattle on Thursday. So they have a chance to even up at three and three, but that's a huge game in the division because of it. Uh, The Giants win 29 to 20 over Seattle in a upset. The Giants take it. Uh, Rayshon Jenkins ends up having a fumble return to start the game seven, nothing. But even at that point, 
I was like, wow, the Giants are completely, utterly dominating Seattle. Like Seattle in the first half could not do an absolute thing on offense. Not a single iota of a thing. They were getting pressured, sacked. They couldn't run the ball. Geno Smith was running for his life. And the entire storyline of the game is that the Seahawks defense was getting shredded by play action boot and the run game. And kind of a very similar game plan to the Patriots, if you really watch what the Giants were doing. Without Malik Neighbors, Wandell Robinson and Darius Slayton were making plays. And I like Tracy, the running back of the Giants. He looks better than Devin Singletary. 18 carries, 129 yards, 7.2 yards per carry. He should get more looks, if not be their starter. Slayton had a vintage game, 8 catches for 122 yards and a touchdown. But Geno Smith... You know, did not play bad. 28 for 40, 284 and a touchdown. It was more so what was around him. They they couldn't block in this game. I mean, it was atrocious. The Giants had seven sacks in the game. Maybe Geno could have sped up his clock a little bit, but it also really hurt the Seahawks that they couldn't run the ball. Kenneth Walker only had, for whatever reason, five carries for 19 yards. I mean, you can't win if you're Seattle like that. You need to run the ball. You need to have balance. They didn't run the ball at all. Seattle was 3 for 11 on third down, 0 for 2 on fourth down. The Giants deserve to win this game. I know that Seattle almost tied it with a field goal at the end that ends up getting blocked and scored by the Giants at the end, which made it 29 because it was 23 to 20. The Giants end up winning 29 to 20 because of the block uh, field goal for a fumble return. Um... But the Giants were just the better team. Seven for 16 on third down. They had more rushing yards. They had more passing yards. They had more total yards. They had seven sacks on defense. Now, there wasn't an interception thrown, but the Giants did fumble once. Um, They had 15 more minutes of possession. I mean, the Giants were the better team. The Giants looked decent in this game. Daniel Jones played pretty well. He was running really well. He was taking on contact. 23 for 34, 257, and two touchdowns without his number one receiver. Daniel Jones looked like 2022 Daniel Jones in this game. 109.6 passer rating. He was throwing it down the field to Darius Slayton. He was throwing it underneath to Wandell Robinson. He was finding his tight end. You know, they were doing a really good job running the ball with multiple running backs, but especially Tyrone Tracy, who looked explosive. And the kicking, you know, was also a story in this game because there was a blocked touch, or there was a, There was a blocked field goal at the end, and everything that could go wrong for Seattle, they looked they looked bad, right? For for San Francisco, it was unlucky more so than bad. Seattle was just straight up bad, in my opinion. Like they looked bad in this game, and they were losing the entire game. This was not like San Francisco where they were up by double digits. No, 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 no. Seattle was fucking bad. Okay. Uh, And the, I think the final game I want to talk about here is the Packers and the Rams. Currently right now, the Steelers and the Cowboys are playing and uh, the first 20 minutes are underway. I'm actually just going to live check in case there's been a score in that game. Oh, it doesn't appear that it's started yet. It's 544 Pacific time. It should have started already. It usually starts at 520 or maybe the score isn't updated. I'm not exactly sure what's going on. But I'm intrigued to watch that game tonight. It is delayed. Oh, okay. I I don't know what's going on there. Maybe weather or something. But Gronk Spike, the like button. Subscribe, guys, if you've enjoyed this reaction. Uh, I'll be on Bleacher Report on Monday for my reaction in the morning, guys. So don't forget about that. And I will post that reaction to YouTube as long as I get the footage from Bleacher Report. 24-19, to the Green Bay Packers take it over the Rams. This was a more of a semi-normal result. I would say that it looked like a dangerous upset early in the game. The Rams looked like the better team throughout the first half. But once again, the Rams kind of shoot themselves in the foot and they're not talented enough to do that, right? Like that's the thing with the Rams is Stafford throws an interception deep down the field. It was almost an arm punt, but still an interception nonetheless that turns momentum. Uh, They fumble the ball which is huge. And Xavier McKinney won this game for the Packers. I mean, Xavier McKinney has been one of the best free agent signings alongside Saquon Barkley in the NFL this offseason. He has been absolutely incredible, arguably the best safety in the league this year. Um, Just, you know, turnovers galore in big moments. And 
The Rams, you look at the stats, they they outplayed the Packers in a lot of areas. Uh, 24 first downs to 19, way better on third down, 8 for 16. The Packers were 1 for 8 on third down. Anytime the Packers get to third down, they have failed all year long. They are a first and second down offense. They are an explosives only offense that has very little uh, precision. And I think that's why they struggle on third down. The Rams were two for four on fourth down early in the game. They should have kicked a field goal. They didn't. Uh, for whatever reason, Sean McVay wants to go for it. If they kick the field goal, it's 24-22, right? And then you think, okay, well, Rams maybe could have gotten to field goal range, which they were very close at the end of the game instead of trying to go for a touchdown, uh, which they ended up going for it on fourth down again, which they ended up getting stopped. So take your points early in games, Sean McVay, Robert Sala. Take your points early in the games full circle. Um, the Jordan Love, I didn't think played very well outside of a couple of big explosive plays that were pretty much manufactured by the offense. Tucker Craft had like, I think a screen for like a touchdown and a long completion yards after catch 66 yard completion yards after catch touchdown by the tight end. Uh, the, the Rams really didn't do a lot on offense though. McCollum or McCullough. I don't know what his name is. Had a interception for a touchdown. Kyron of course got his classic touchdown and Demarcus Robinson got a touchdown at the end, but it felt like the Rams they rather would go for it on fourth down, wouldn't get it. They would settle, uh, or they wouldn't settle, but they just they just kind of struggled like to push the ball into the necessary scoring position. They would move the ball a little bit, but it felt like every time they would kind of get close, they would get halted. Um, the Packers defense did play pretty well in this game, and they came up with opportune stops. I would say that, and it's nice to see the Packers win a game through their defense instead of their offense for a change. Because I really didn't feel like their offense played well. I thought Love was still missing throws. I felt like Love was way too downfield aggressive and it wasn't paying off. You really see the loss of Romeo Dobbs and Christian Watson in this game. Both those receivers are missed down the field. Wicks can't catch the ball. And, you know, Heath is not very good. And Jaden Reed is good. But when he's the only guy that's really making any plays, it's kind of tough. Whittington for the Rams had another good game, seven catches for 89 yards. If you're looking for a fantasy pickup, he might be a good one. Same as Tucker Craft, who is the best receiver on the Packers in this game, four catches for 88 yards and two touchdowns. Um, he's the tight end, by the way. But yeah, I mean, the Packers punted more often. Both teams only had six and five penalties. The Rams had the ball more. The Rams had more first downs. The Rams were better on third down, but the Rams lost. Turnovers, fourth down decisions, explosive plays. That's pretty much what it comes down to. Kyron Williams did have another good game. 22 carries for 102 yards and a touchdown. Josh Jacobs, another pretty pedestrian game. He did score a touchdown, but only 3.8 yards per carry. 19 carries, 73 yards. Love continues to frustrate me. He's probably the most overrated quarterback in the league right now, maybe outside of Jalen Hurts. He misses so many easy throws, so many completions. That's why they're so frustrating on third down. He misses like a first down play in the flat where he throws the ball like four yards too far or something, and it costs them on their drives because then it sets them back in, in their sequencing of their plays. Um, and I felt that throughout the entire first half. If this is a better team, the Rams are a better team, this game's probably over at halftime because it felt like the Rams were able to you know, really kind of like control the first half. They just weren't able to take advantage of it. A really lackluster start from, from the Packers. That's what it felt like. But then the Packers in the third quarter, they kind of have a couple big explosive plays and, you know, re, you know, their first touchdown was basically a long completion to read for, and then that set up a touchdown. Their other touchdown was a long touchdown by Kraft. And then later on, they had like a little bit more of a drive but I think that might have been off of Kyron's fumble, if I'm not mistaken, where they had a little bit more of a shorter field, which allowed Kraft to score. So like when you really dive into the Packers drives, they basically have like four plays that win them the game. Basically, the interception and the fumble on defense and, and the fourth down stops and then like the two explosive throws. And that's it. 
Like their precision, their rhythm, their consistency is very, very, very lackluster, very annoying because they feel like they should be better than that on a consistency basis. But give them credit. They won 24 to 19. So give them credit. I think their most impressive part, I would say, is their defense. I thought their defense played better in this game Um, and McKinney showed up. They need to find a way to get their run game going a little bit more, and they need to get Christian Watson or Romeo Dobbs back because that's definitely going to hurt them in bigger games the next few weeks. Actually, who do they play next week? The Packers play the... Oh, they have a bye. Nope, they don't have a bye. Who do they play? Oh, the Cardinals. That'll be inter- That'll be a good game, actually, I think. All right, guys. Well, thanks for watching. It's Mitch. Thank you so much for watching the Sunday Reaction. Complete madness of an NFL week five. I can't pick games. You can't pick games. No one can pick games. This league is a complete joke. Nobody is that good. Uh, Hopefully somebody shows up. (laughs) Monday night, we've got the Chiefs. They're probably going to win some garbage way. Uh, The Vikings are still undefeated. Congratulations. The Texans are four and one. Congratulations. The Ravens get a big win in the AFC North. The Niners drop another heartbreaking loss. The Patriots suck. And the Jags actually win a game. So shout out to those teams. Uh, Thanks for watching. It's Mitch. Peace.